For many, the Dr. Doolittle books, written and illustrated by Hugh Lofting, were a threshold into the story world of a whimsy doctor turned naturalist who became known for communicating with animals across the globe. And that introduction, for many, including myself, came through the adaptations of the books through other mediums, and especially through the many film adaptations that have been released over the course of nearly a century. And as the previous part of this series discussed the origins and books of this franchise, that is where this voyage in the wondrous story world of Dr. Doolittle takes us next. As I stated, Dr. Doolittle has captured the imaginations of generations through many available and relevant media platforms, across film screens and beyond. There was a radio series hosted by NBC in the 1930s. There was one stage play adaptation by Hugh Lofting's sister-in-law that was released in the 1970s, while along with that, three other unique stage adaptations that were released in 1973, 1998, and 2007. And lastly, thanks to a search on IMDb, I found out that there were two animated television series. The first aired on NBC from 1970 to 1971, and was produced slash co-created by the same team and company for the 1967 film adaptation. And from the pilot episode I found for the show, the A plot was about Skywag pirates, and the B plot was about Doolittle and gang island hopping from place to place. Oh, and there were singing grasshoppers, so I guess that was groovy. And the second television series was released in 1984 in Japan, and that series was titled after the second book. Another attributing factor is Dr. Doolittle's theme song. The song, written by Leslie Brickus, originated on the 1967 film soundtrack, and was Doolittle's expression of revelation to talk to the animals, as the title prescribes. And I personally enjoy the clever wordplay and how jazzy the song actually is, and I feel has a resonance to every animal lover out there. Leslie also had a lasting creative partnership with Anthony Newley, who not only starred as Matthew Mugg and sang the film soundtrack on his self-titled album, but also collaborated when producing the soundtrack for Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, and I found quite a bit of charm and imagination experimented with that was reminiscent in both. Not to mention that the track has had a legacy of its own. The song won an Oscar at the 1968 Academy Awards, has been covered by multiple artists, and has been featured in other places as well. The first adaptation takes us all the way to the 1920s. Lot Reininger was a pioneering silhouette animator who was known for joining together hand-cut paper with wire hinges, maneuvering them under projected lights, and would often adapt fairy tales and other stories, such as 1928's The Adventures of Prince Ahmed, a film I highly recommend checking out, that's also said to be the oldest surviving feature-length animated feature. And when researching Lot's work to gain access to 1928's Dr. Doolittle and his animals, as I've seen him mentioned, I had to buy a Blu-ray of Prince Ahmed, only to realize that the DVD said there were three short films bunched together and released in 1923. And these were presented as little comedies with episodic introductions to our protagonists and straight into the plot of the first book. Doolittle and gang are hanging out in England when they are told of an epidemic and are requested to take a trip to Africa. Upon a shipwreck arriving to the continent in the second film, titled Cannibal Island, they are met with different culture receptions and are chased into their ultimate rescue mission in a concluding celebration of dance and relief in Lion's Den. Although there was a challenge seeking out Lot's Doolittle films, I happily enjoyed seeing this creation. And along with the soothing gray hues of imagery and poetic subtitles, this film has a classical musical arrangement by Philip Bram and some non-diegetic animal sounds that added to the fun. The animation throughout the films from a technical standpoint is so impressive, not only in how smooth and thorough the cutouts movements were, especially when they were clustered or when there were multiple subjects side by side, but also from how memorable they all were in their color contrasts. The two I specifically noted were when Doolittle and his animals were shown on their ship sailing in a wide shot behind a white backdrop, as the more enlarged foreground had the ocean's waves move in a circular, like, loop. And the other shot was during their imprisonment, where Reininger did a splendid job at also keeping it wide, but having the screen nearly pitch black except for its center, and with the characters interacting within that intimate space. 
In those cases and throughout, there was such a distinct functionality that really emphasized the character's individuality, such as Doolittle's selflessness or some of the animals' leadership qualities, and that really gave them all moments to enrapture the audience. And for that, I felt this was phenomenally done. Next up on our list is 1967's Dr. Doolittle, which stars Rex Harrison. Being the first live-action interpretation of the books, this film is, interestingly enough, a post-classical era musical. In this age of cinema specifically, the inclusion of musicality was lessening in popularity in favor of approaches of gritty realism that were epic and were challenging the potentiality of the camera. AKA, they just wanted to experiment and see what was cool. Although, in the 1960s and 1970s, there were still released musicals that have popularity to this day. In the case of 20th Century Fox, who took up the offer to obtain the rights and utilize its deluxe color deal to film the adaptation, the studio really wanted to see success with this film and the two other mega-budget musicals they were simultaneously invested in creating. And the film had potential to follow up on the success of My Fair Lady and bring together the collaborative effort from the film of Harrison, lyricist Alan J. Lerner, and composer Frederick Loewe, which although not working out was able to garner the involvement of Leslie Brickus, who was in high demand at the time and was a great choice in my opinion, to write the screenplay and music. Furthermore, the film went over budget, spending over $17 million and having a runtime of over 152 minutes. In over the four years of production, having to also overcome adversities that range from the handling of 1,200 live animal actors to some hurdles with on-location shooting. We find ourselves at Puddleby in Victorian England, as we follow Tommy Stubbins and his acquaintance Matthew Mugg, who's acquired an injured duck from a fisherman, as they head off to the home of Dr. Doolittle. And during their visit, Tommy is the perspective of the audience, as we are told about Doolittle's newfound passion to communicate with every animal species and of his friendship with Matthew. But also, we are propelled into Doolittle's motive to discover the great glass pink sea snail with the help of his friend Long Arrow, who has a devised plan that carries into many other unexpected adventures in between. The plot does remain faithful while also forming its own creative liberties, allowing borrowed narrative elements from the books to come to life. Some of them including a side plot of a homesick seal performing in the circus, and whales helping push the island they travel to so the animals inhabiting it could be properly treated. Not to mention that the visual effects in the film were very innovative, from utilizing both green screens and location shooting, to utilizing lifelike puppets slash animatronics and animal actors. Its animated opening credits sync with the music really nicely, it has almost silhouetted animals in motion, and when speaking of its larger production, had a wider scale and embellishment of long takes that kept with a personable viewing experience. Because of that, 1967's Dr. Doolittle carries such an imagination from start to finish. And in both this film and the books, all beings, including animals and mythical, extraordinary creatures, happily befriend the Doctor. With the exception of two characters created for the film, who go by General Bellows and his niece Emma Fairfax. They both, within the larger narrative, don't initially have an accepting comprehension of Doolittle's personality, accusing him of stealing their horse and having a lack of empathy. And the familial dynamic here does place Doolittle at two interesting ends of interactions. On the one hand, Emma, after singing At the Crossroads, does open herself up to the lifestyle of the gang and also has that represented in her bright and neutral color costume design that's also found with her counterparts, which I found really stood out in this film for the patterns and styles the film played around with. Although having to prove her worth and helpfulness on their voyage does become the object of a love triangle between Matthew and Doolittle. Personally, I felt this was my least favorite aspect of the film because I felt a great deal of its duration was spent with her importance to being an objective interest. And as Matthew is pulled at the heartstrings, and adorably so, over her, Doolittle then enters in like the third act when singing Something in Your Smile and just entices his infatuation with a headstrong tenacity. And it was just a strange happenstance because Doolittle in the books and before that point in the film is this established selfless individual whose love was for his animals, his career, and the close friends he entrusted because they have similar interest. General Bellows, on the other hand, is a sort of antagonist and continues to dislike Doolittle into what's 
probably my favorite scene found in this adaptation that does transition the film from its gleeful whimsy tone into one that's intense just on its own. In the town's courtroom, the general is the magistrate that confronts Doolittle about a murder case he never committed, because fishermen mistook him casting a woman's body into sea when it was actually the seal performer in disguise. And in this scene especially, Rex Harrison has these subtle mannerisms of optimism that also have a hidden worry of defeat. That places his exclaims on environmentalism and the commodity and overall treatment of animals on a literal pedestal. It genuinely left me speechless for how nuanced the commentary was and how powerful the delivery of the topics were, especially when you had Leslie's score become equally as scorching intense. And Doolittle, who is our hero here, wasn't successful in his testimony and was acquitted to an asylum. And for seeing how his differences from the human world really placed him behind bars like an animal, but also to have his voice be suppressed was devastating, but also a decision that was a reality. And its awareness of that state of thinking, when reflected on today, just was handled with such brilliance in my eyes. And I loved Tommy and Matthew's gazes at each other during this scene as well, and just, Anthony Newey's performance easily became a favorite of mine in this film, because he captured the content, practicality, and simplistic attitude Matthew also brought in the books, and that also radiated this contagious smile on my face. And from hearing his singing voice more and how that is implemented in this musical, Newey tends to note standout words through vocal inflections that do emphasize his almost silvery higher vocal register. And I felt that this was a great balance to the other actors who had a bit more of a soft-spoken yet gravitas voice delivery. Overall, even with its blemishes, I really had an enjoyable time watching this film, and its musicality and pure imagination really enraptured me into what the story world could offer next. 31 years after Rex Harrison portrayed Dr. Doolittle, 20th Century Fox decided to take audiences into a modern and diversified take on this story, starring actor and comedian Eddie Murphy. The plot of the first of the five films in this iteration starts off by introducing John Doolittle, who is born with the gift of communicating with animals, finding relatability in his family dog rather than human behavior. However, with his father's push towards his son being normal, John's best friend is given away, and his gift is repressed up to adulthood. At the start of each film includes transitions into B-roll of San Francisco, with a fused contemporary jazz slash pop soundtrack, and some narration throughout by another man's best friend. And here we are brought to a present day, where John is a successful surgeon with human clientele and has a family of his own, which includes his wife and two children. However, in the midst of the plans for a merger with his medical company and a hectic work slash life balance, a lucky encounter comes around. And from this point, John not only learns to embrace his giving gifts, but to also move forward into an eventual career as a traveling veterinarian. The 1998 Dr. Doolittle film definitely left me at odds in its execution and its character development choices. While I enjoy witnessing Eddie Murphy take his own approach of comedic delivery and sincerity to the narrative, I was also curious as to why it took until this part in his life for animals to realize that he understood them and their languages. And that plot hole in particular also left me with wondering what it would be like if Doolittle just became a veterinarian from the get-go, who was already studying and writing about his own observations, and then see him still work to accept his different qualities of life. Because in the film, his differences are treated by priests or traditional viewpoints or by mental institutions. And for the growing world of acceptance and speaking for social change today, I felt that the film's established antagonists could have been tackled by Doolittle standing up for himself more and for, as this film even mentions, making a difference with his difference. Although I thought the film was strengthened significantly in its third act, as well as a few other elements throughout that I really loved. Kyla Pratt, who we will continue to see portraying Maya Doolittle, it's truly a vehicle for her father accepting himself for who he is, and also for her grandfather to have a change of heart towards his old-fashioned outlook. Because of how she enjoys science and animals like her dad, I can just personally empathize with her wanting to be herself, no matter how weird her curiosity is said to be, and that led me to wanting to give her a hug. 
She gave such a sweet performance here and I really appreciated how her adversities were seen upon the older generation raising her and I just loved her inclusion in this installment so much. I also really liked the animals we got to engage with and I warmed up to the characters deviating from what was familiar from the books, with the exception of the fun nod to the Push Me Pull You and Blossom Circus, which I really appreciated. And although the juvenile crude humor and pop culture references were immense, I did enjoy the voice talent that added versatility to the otherwise commonplace species. And it truly was the executions of their performances that I found took time to adjust to, but I thought were really astonishing from a technical perspective. All of the ensemble of animals were formed through some combination of animal actors with CGI and green screen elements, but there also were moments of interactive work through puppetry that allowed for so much imagination like the 1967 film to have the wildlife feel real. And in my favorite scene, which includes all of these techniques, was a noteworthy surgery from one of the larger mammals Doolittle finds himself helping. And also was one of the best examples of how Doolittle and the animals converse with one another, to where you're able to easily identify the differentiation of who can understand who. And that also reminded me of the earlier adaptation in how we can love all creatures, regardless of how much we may understand them ourselves. And that takes us into Dr. Doolittle 2, which takes place a few years after the 1998 film's events. To summarize, the sequel is primarily a deforestation message with an inner motive to conserve the newly extinct Pacific Western bears, one of them being a performer named Archie, as Doolittle promises to rehabilitate Archie back to the wild and ensure he falls in love with Ava, another of that species, he takes his family to spend a month-long vacation in the San Franciscan woods, in a different spot from their previous cabin getaway. All the while handling negotiations with campy, antagonistic business execs who want to use the forest land for their own gain. With similar production quality and animal actor techniques from the last installments, this film does have a more simplified storyline, and I felt that it had a lot of creative potential for Doolittle here to grow beyond worrying about his status quo, and in place of that were these estranged rom-com side plots and a predictable happily ever after at the end. Which takes me into discussing Archie, who I didn't really like out of the ensemble. Personally, I felt that his arc and identity crisis of transitioning from a life of domestication in the circus to the wild wasn't as far removed as it could have been, even from the small town the forest engulfed. Had his confidence boost been gradual and increasingly empathetic, we could have seen a significant shift in his character development to where we really root for him where he stands up for himself, especially because he had Doolittle primarily being his encouragement. And also there is this investment towards the animal striking for change and having this mutuality between humans and animals, and I was hoping the deliverance of the characters, whether we already knew them or not, to have the opportunities that I saw met in its predecessor, which did that and also embraced using visual effects to emphasize that a bit more. Nonetheless, I was so happy to see Therese, played by Raven Simone, being given the more significant role in a similar way to Maya's position in the first film. But in this case, you get Charisse as this rebellious, fashionable, music-loving, and yet quite reserved teenage girl having to abide with her family's quirks. And although showing annoyance of them is revealed in the third act to also communicate with animals. And I actually found that the individual scene where she opens up about that was really powerful and well acted. And it was the perfect scene in my mind to redeem Teresa's maturity level and bond with her father. And it did show a new perspective on the challenges and appreciations she has in her family unit. And that allowed her to be properly understood. And although Simone and Murphy don't continue in this franchise after this point, I really bought into how their father-daughter moments blossomed in this film. This takes us into the realm of the direct-to-DVD sequels. As Therese has moved out for college and John is traveling globally for studies and such, Maya by the third film is being raised at home by her mom and is now a teenager. She is driving, is wearing trendy outfits, is in high school extracurricular activities and preparing for college, seeking out to go to parties and maintaining friendships in her social life, and finding love interests whom just magically appear in every single sequel and aren't Anthony Newley, that's all I'm saying, but anyway, the plots do have some but are also easy to explain in their chronology. 
Dr. Doolittle 3 sends Maya, wanting to belong in her high school environment and adapted to city life, to a summer program at a ranch that her mother attended years prior. And wouldn't you know it, she finds herself slowly making friends and opening herself up. Although during her stay, the ranch is about to shut down due to financial issues, but thanks to Maya's newfound confidence in talking about her gift, everyone is able to help raise money and save the ranch by competing in a rodeo. The fourth film, Dr. Doolittle, Tale to the Chief, has Maya preparing college applications and interviews for the next chapter of her life. It seems to be going well, except for the fact that she's being constantly compared to her father, and with that discontentment takes on more experience under her belt by accepting the opportunity to help the President of the United States, and more specifically, help ensure his dog's behavior is managed during a legislation agreement to save the global forest. And the last of the five films, titled Dr. Doolittle, Million Dollar Mutts, is about Maya feeling hesitant about higher education being the right path for her if she wants to immediately help animals. And before she has to move out for college, she accepts an offer to help out and be friends an actress who didn't know her dog was actually a male. Oh, and there's also this larger plot of Maya and the actress starring in their own show with a self-revelation speech, some good old Hollywood tropes, and a happy ending. On the whole, I thought the direct-to-DVD sequels had some substance that was added to the lore of Dr. Doolittle in this world, but it also followed a lot of narrative conventions that haven't seen before and could be predicted, and even from the same franchise, especially when it came to how the larger wildlife message would enter the picture. There was always this generic, over-the-top villain character, supporting cast that tagged along that liked or eventually liked Maya, you had animals within their own environments that had very specific needs to be assisted for. You had Maya who would be on some school break, then be given the opportunity to travel and hashtag find herself, which would be approved by her mother, of course. And the montages. Holy moly, guacamole, there were so many montages. And overall, for the productions themselves, the only other thing that really stood out to me were a few odd edits, but was otherwise pretty solid. Out of the bunch, I personally enjoyed the fourth Doolittle film the most. I enjoyed the almost father and nature-loving mentorship the president exemplified, which reminded me of a book I read growing up of presidents who've had exotic pets, and getting to see a natural preserve and have it still familiarize with animals that were still a mighty task for Maya was great to see for her character defying personal growth. I just really loved the concept executed in this film, even for how cheesy and conventional it became at some parts as I aforementioned, but it really was the ensemble cast that helped carry it. They all had their own performed banters and distinct qualities, and some of them had purposeful arcs that I appreciated being called back upon. And even for how extraordinary the plot sounds, I did believe that a Doolittle could be in such a storyline, with the stakes being beyond themselves. And as for the two characters that have stayed with this franchise, it was nice to have Lucky as a mediator of both parties and seeing him having dry humor and words of wisdom balanced out in his personality. Norm Macdonald has an almost high and low register voice that's soothing, and the pet's owner friendship between him and Maya was really believable thanks to the writing and having that assurance in each installment that they would always be together. As for Maya, I felt Kyla Pratt really took on the task of being the driving force of the films, and I loved her smunky, ambitious personality. It was a pleasure getting to see her grow with the role and witnessing her spotlight her other capabilities, while also providing, time and time again, how Maya really does care for the animal she's around. The only exception I found was really with how the direct-to-DVD sequels placed more pressure on Maya by having her sense of self-understanding be rediscovered and almost reversed for that to be the case. Maya, to me, is a headstrong and persistent young woman in her own focus to follow her father's footsteps, whilst being equally met with adversities of belonging in a social crowd and finding her voice as a doolittle, and also didn't seem to be as embraceive of feminine norms as her sister gravitated to. I just had a different expectation of the story's promise, where it was portrayed that Maya was in love with her veterinary lifestyle and already had this impressive log of experience to use for college applications, per se. Instead, Maya is facing a lot of dense tasks that involve her growth within adolescence in addition to that. 
But regardless, I never lost the magic and devotion Pratt had within this character, and her performance and evolving of Maya Doolittle really led her to shine. As my last note for these iterations, the major thing that I saw potential in throughout watching this interpretation from start to finish was having John Doolittle and his family having adventures together, and being a family who uniquely cared for animals. Especially when the first sequel shared the cameo with Steve Irwin, I couldn't help but continue to remind myself of how incredible it would have been, because Doolittle has a family here, to see them all embrace life as a cohesive unit with this unique value of living life to the fullest. Having Doolittle teach his daughters about his own communication studies and work, and endorsing Maya to continue the love of wildlife they share, while their mother serves as the foundation for a maternal role model in helping them navigate womanhood. This approach would have allowed the daughters to really broaden their horizons and senses of self, regardless of the real world around them. And maybe could have been the catalyst for the Doolittles to voyage to various parts of the world, and getting to share how beautiful and important the biosphere of this earth truly is. And even if a fair share of production hurdles and the desire for humor and relatable cliches was still there, just having Maya and Lucky having that prior exposition would have led to a stronger threshold that felt the pressures of the world and even of themselves. But finding the best in everything and knowing that she forever has her family and others along the way. And I could imagine that seeing a fictional perspective of the Irwin family would have been something my younger self would fall in love with. Even for how keen iconic personalities were becoming at that time as advocates for those wildlife oriented conversations. In any case, the second take of this franchise by 20th Century Fox does have its own twists and turns, and I'd personally recommend these films for anyone who may be curious to see a real-life Doolittle family. And last but not least, we have the 2011 3D animated direct-to-DVD film known as The Voyages of Young Dr. Doolittle. This was by far the most fascinating of the bunch, simply because I honestly would have never known that it even existed had I not evaluated this franchise in full. Quintessentially, the story goes that the nephew of John Doolittle, as foretold through a storybook format, is motivated to voyage in events just like his adventurous uncle. And after Jib nearly flies out of one of his experiments, Dab Dab collides with Polly and gives cautions about the dangers on his uncle's once designated island. Since the doctor left at some point and envious Ramsey the Ram became the ruler, and Ramsey reigns over the reciting animals on his highly elevated rock, where he's assisted by his horse sidekick named Chomps, who communicates with Ramsey's gorilla posse, and they dictate the land because they can. And now these four characters are destined, upon Polly calling onto John's snail submarine, to journey to the island, and without fully giving out spoilers, their confrontations with the antagonists succeed, and all the characters still live to see another day on the island as young Doolittle's parents have been on an extended vacation to Bora Bora this whole time. And beyond some other odd side plots and sidekicks that are introduced throughout this A plot, that's about it. The pacing had a very off-putting slow or fast flow. The soundtrack and sound effects would interchange just as rapidly and sometimes overpower the dialogue. The camera would sometimes just fly. There were various creative decisions with the editing of the film that jumped to spontaneous places or was out of sync with the animation, and the animation and character designs themselves were simplistic, and their appearances were alright overall, but the color and lighting was also bright and pastel-like, with backgrounds that feel very stagnant and choppy and without any filled-in nature scenery. Overall, I feel that a larger budget and a condensed story structure and runtime with less generic characters would have really helped garner investment in the final product that much more. And I say that because the film and this concept does have potential. I liked the attempt made to extend the story world with a younger point of view that was a relative of a Doolittle, and that his distant nephew had a resemblance to his uncle in a lot of ways. And the voice tone had talent to back it up, and that made it enjoyable for what it was. Another thing that I really loved and was surprised about was that they not only had an intro credit sequence that heavily resembled the 1967 film, but also that the animation here had a 2D feel style, 
and more specifically through the storybook segments. The creativity in the sequence alone was nicely done. And now keeping all of these adaptations in mind, there still is just one more film in this evaluation of the Dr. Doolittle story world that we need to talk about. Mm -hmm.